Welcome to How to Effectively Implement a Lubricant Specification and Tagging System. I'm Jared Pottiger, Education Services Manager for DeskCase. In today's presentation, we'll discuss the benefits of using a generic system of nomenclature for lubricant specifications as opposed to using the names of specific products. There are a lot of advantages to this, and we'll discuss exactly what those are. We'll also talk about the danger of cross-contamination, what can happen when you mix two different lubricants, and why that makes a good tagging system so important. We'll also discuss how to interpret OEM lubricant specifications so we can take those specific products and turn them into a generic type of description. And then finally, We'll discuss how to create a tagging system that uses shapes and colors and text to effectively identify which lubricants go into which transfer containers, into which lube points, and come out of which dispensing systems. So what are the benefits of a generic specification system? Well, for starters, it makes it easy to interpret OEM specifications. Different equipment manufacturers recommend products from different lubricant manufacturers, so this makes it easy for us to take those recommendations and translate them into something that's easy to communicate to our preferred lubricant supplier. This also makes it easy to consolidate inventory. When we take specific product names and translate them into a generic description, it naturally reveals redundant products which many people have. So once we've gone through this process we can identify all the products that fit the same description, pick one, and eliminate the others. This also makes it easier to avoid cross-contaminating lubricants which of course is the primary point of the tagging system but by having fewer lubricants it makes it even less likely that we're going to have issues. Then finally, it makes it easy to switch brands as well. From time to time, for a number of different reasons, plants are required to change lubricant suppliers from one manufacturer to another. If we have all of our lubricants specified in a generic system, we can know that we're comparing apples to apples, and it makes the conversion much easier. It also allows us to avoid having to re-tag equipment that might have had product-specific equipment tags associated with it. Cross-contamination of different lubricants is probably a lot more common than most people realize. If you go into the average plant, you'll find a significant number of the machines in that plant contain mixtures of different lubricants. Now this doesn't always cause a major problem immediately, but sometimes it does, and most of the time it causes more subtle problems that really don't reveal themselves unless we do oil analysis. Some of the things that can happen by mixing different lubricants are things like additive loss. And when we lose additives, you know, additive packages in different lubricants can interact with each other. And usually when that happens, we end up losing the performance characteristic that is affected by that particular type of additive. So we can have loss of oxidative stability. We could have loss of anti-wear performance. One of the most common issues that we see with mixing different lubricants is an increase in, in trained air and in foam in the system. We could also experience a loss of demulsibility, so the oil would not be as effective at separating from water. Usually if we lose additives, these additives are going to go somewhere, so they're going to end up as sludge in the system which can lead to deposits and other problems. Now when it comes to grease, our primary concern isn't necessarily additive loss, it's more serious than that. When we mix incompatible greases, it typically results in a dramatic increase or decrease in consistency. Basically the mixture either turns to a liquid or it turns to a solid. Either way, we can typically experience a catastrophic failure as a result. Lubricating oils have two basic components. The base oil, which makes up the majority of the finished lubricant, and gives us two components in our lubricant specification, the base oil type and the base oil viscosity. The other part of the lubricant is the additive system or additive package, as it's sometimes called, and this is going to give us the type of lubricant. Base oils can be divided into five different base oil groups, the API base oil groups. 
Groups 1, 2, and 3 are what we usually call mineral oils, and groups 4 and 5 are synthetic oils. Now, group 1 utilizes an older refining technology. It's been around for a long time. Group 1s usually aren't used in newer industrial oils except for the higher viscosity oils. Most high quality industrial lubricants these days use group 2 base oils. Group 2 utilizes a process called hydro treating or hydro cracking which further saturates the molecules in the lubricating oil creating a, a better performing product. Group 3 is a highly refined hydro treated product that has even better performance properties and in some cases it can have performance that approaches that of a synthesized mineral oil or synthetic hydrocarbon or as it's uh, more accurately described a polyalpha olefin. So this is the group four and essentially it's like a mineral oil but because it's man-made it's very consistent and all of the molecules are exactly the way the chemist wants them to be so by doing this we can dictate the performance properties of the finished lubricant. Group 5 is pretty much everything else. All of the other synthetics, the esters, the silicon, uh, polyglycol, etc. All of these are put into group 5, I guess because they didn't want to have many, many uh, different groups for each of those products. Now, with few exceptions, groups 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all better than the the last so group two is a little better than group one group three is a little better than group two and group four is better still now the group five base oils have very good performance properties in certain categories but they may also have relatively poor performance in other categories so the group five base oils are usually reserved for more specialized applications now the other part of the specification that comes from the base oil is the viscosity grade. Now viscosity is typically considered to be the most important property of a lubricant. So when we're creating a specification, this is the thing that we really need to get correct. Viscosity is the primary attribute of the lubricating oil that gives the oil film strength or essentially allows it to lubricate. Um, the current standard for expressing viscosity is kinematic viscosity and it is measured and expressed in cinestokes and this is what gives us our ISO viscosity grade. Now there are a number of other different viscosity grading systems. Again, the ISO viscosity grade is the standard these days, but different equipment manufacturers may still use other viscosity grading systems. Uh, some gear manufacturers will use the AGMA or American Gear Manufacturers Association viscosity grades which are simple because they have a single digit. They're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. Some equipment manufacturers, even though it's the, the component is not necessarily an engine, sometimes they use crankcase viscosity grades. Like we see a lot of compressors that will call for a 30 weight oil, which is an SAE crankcase viscosity grade. Some industrial gearboxes will call for an SAE gear oil grade such as a 90 weight or possibly even again a crankcase viscosity grade like a 50 weight. You may have a really old gearbox where the viscosity is specified in say bolt seconds at 100 degrees Fahrenheit like a thousand say bolt seconds. Now if you look at the chart on the screen you'll see that a thousand say bolt seconds or a 90 weight gear oil or a 50 weight motor oil or an AGMA 5 are all the same thing as an ISO 220. So we don't need to memorize these but we do need to be aware that all of these different viscosity grading systems exist and we may need to translate that. So if you get a viscosity comparison chart like the one we see on the screen here you can easily translate from one viscosity system to the next. So now that we've covered the first two parts of the specification, the type of base oil we're going to use and the ISO viscosity grade, the next and the last piece of the specification is the type of oil it is. Now the good news is with industrial lubricants anyway, there really are only four different basic types of lubricants. 
we have RNO lubricants, anti-wear, extreme pressure, and compounded lubricants. Now the first in this list here is RNO lubricants or rust and oxidation inhibited. This is like turbine oil. These are very lightly additized finished lubricants. They contain rust inhibitors, they contain oxidation inhibitors as the name suggests. They may also have other additives as well like anti-foam or a demulsifying agent. The next category is anti-wear or AW and the anti-wear lubricants will typically con contain all of the same additives as the RNO but they also have an anti-wear agent that's designed to prevent or minimize wear when we have light metal to metal contact. Now where you have a lot of metal to metal contact or you have heavily loaded contacts between surfaces we use extreme pressure lubricants or EP. Most of our gear oils will typically be EP oils and these once again have rust and oxidation inhibitors and anti-foam and others but they also have an extreme pressure agent usually a sulfur phosphorus compound that minimizes wear under what we call boundary lubrication conditions which is where there's a lot of metal to metal contact between the surfaces. The last one in our list is compounded lubricants. Now compounded lubricants are somewhat rare compared to the others here. Uh, compounded lubricants were originally used for steam cylinders. Compounded lubricants use high viscosity mineral oils typically with the addition of a synthetic fat uh, traditionally it was actually in, in a real animal fat like beef tallow and this tallow would give extra lubricity make basically make the oil more slippery but it would also emulsify water and basically trap it and make it less harmful which was very useful in steam cylinders most people don't use steam cylinders these days but we do still use compounded lubricants in worm gear applications because of the improved lubricity. So those are the three primary parts of our specification. We have the base oil type, we have the base oil viscosity grade, and the additive system or lubricant type. That's a lubricating oil. When it comes to grease we actually have more things to consider. We have one additional component in the finished lubricant and we have two additional parts to our specification. A lubricating grease is essentially a lubricating oil that has been thickened so it'll stick to things, so it'll stay in place. So we have all of the same parts of the specification as we had with the oil. We have the base oil type, the base oil viscosity grade, and the additive system, but we also need to add the thickener type. So we need to choose the most appropriate thickener type based on the situation that we have. And then finally we'll specify the NLGI grade which basically tells us how thick the grease is. So it, it tells us what the consistency of the grease is or how much thickener is in it. So when it comes to selecting the most appropriate type of grease thickener, we really have to think about what the thickener does, which again is to hold the lubricating oil in place. So we want to use a thickener that holds the oil in place well in the situation that we have. So imagine that we have a steel mill application where the temperature is a big concern. So the bearing temperatures are very, very hot. We want to use a grease that holds up very well to high temperatures. And for this reason, a lot of people have used clay-based greases in steel mill applications over the years, although it's not as common as it once was. But it still works very well in high temperature applications. Uh, another very common application that we select grease for is electric motors. So electric motor greases often use polyurea thickeners and that makes a lot of sense because polyurea thickeners have two properties that are very very good for electric motors. One is the shear stability or the mechanical stability of the grease. This basically means the grease maintains its consistency very well in service for a long time. The other is bleed resistance. So polyurea thickened greases tend to separate very slowly which is ideal for a ball bearing and especially for one in an electric motor where we want the grease to last a very long time. Now if you consider a another common situation that arises with grease lubricated bearings uh, that is water. So say for example on the wet end of a paper machine 
moisture ingression into grease lubricated bearings is a very big concern. So for the wet end of a paper machine, we may want to consider using a calcium sulfonate thickened grease or a calcium complex or aluminum complex or another type of thickener that holds up very well to moisture. And then imagine still that we have a multi-purpose grease or we have a lot of different applications for which we're going to use the same type of grease. In that case, something like a lithium complex makes a lot of sense because it performs very good in most respects. It really doesn't have any bad attributes and it's pretty good across the board, which makes it a common choice and a good choice for a general purpose or multi-purpose industrial grease. Now, one of the other things that we have to consider with respect to grease thickener is compatibility. Now, compatibility is sometimes viewed as a, you could even say a performance characteristic, or at least an important thing to consider when selecting grease thickener types. It would be nice if the greases that we use were all compatible with each other. As we mentioned before, when we mix incompatible greases or greases with incompatible thickener types, usually the result is going to be a dramatic increase or decrease in consistency, which can lead to a catastrophic failure in the lubricated components. So we need to make sure that the greases we're using, if possible, are compatible with each other, or we need to be that much more vigilant when it comes to preventing cross-contamination. In addition to specifying the type of thickener we use, we also need to specify how much of it or how thick the grease should be. So the grease consistency is described by the NLGI grade. Now for the vast majority of manually applied grease and grease lubricated bearings, we use an NLGI grade too. It seems to be pretty much ideal for most grease lubricated bearings. Sometimes we might want to deviate a bit. We might want to go with an NLGI 1 if we have very cold temperatures or if we have an automatic system where we need to pump grease over a significant dif distance or in some cases if we have very high speeds and or very high temperatures we might want to use a little bit thicker grease like an NLGI 3. Now, at first, that may seem counterintuitive to use a higher consistency grease in a high-speed application because, of course, we use low viscosity in high-speed applications. But if you think about what the thickener is there to do, it's there to hold that oil in place, it really does make sense. So if we have a very high-speed application, we may need a stiffer grease so that it stays in place under those high speeds or high temperatures. So now that we've discussed what all of the different components of a lube spec are, let's look at an example of how we might take a named product and translate that into a generic specification. So just as an example, let's consider Mobile SHC 626, which is a common synthetic bearing oil. So the first part of the specification is just LO, or lubricating oil, which just tells us what we're dealing with. The next part, which is a very important part, is the ISO viscosity grade. So we have an ISO 68, 626 is an ISO 68. And in our tagging system here, we're going to go ahead and use a symbol to represent an ISO 68. So we're going to use a triangle in that case. Now we could use anything, but this is just an example. The next part of the specification is the base oil type. So in this case, uh, an SHC 626 uses a polyalpha olefin or an API Group 4 base oil. We could very easily call this API 4 or G4 for Group 4. But in this case, we're going to use the color black to symbolize the polyalpha olefin or the synthetic hydrocarbon. Then the last part of the specification is the additive system. So this is an anti-wear oil. So in this case, for anti-wear, we're going to use the yellow. So we have yellow on one side to indicate what type of additive system that we have and we have black on the other to indicate the type of base oil and then we have a triangle that indicates the ISO viscosity grade. So we have alphanumeric uh, text that's going to spell out what type of oil it is and we also have colors and shapes that indicate the, the oil specification as well. Now in the example there, we could use that blank space to actually fill in the actual product name if we wanted to. So we could put in that space, Mobile SHC 
626. So that's an example of a lubricating oil. Now let's look at an example of a lubricating grease. So in this case, we have a polyurea NLGI2 base oil 100 mineral oil AW. So this is an electric motor grease. So it could be, for example, Chevron SRI grease, which is a very common electric motor grease. So if we look at the different parts of the spec, the PU at the beginning, that's going to tell us the thickener type. So that's polyurea. The next is the 2, which is the NLGI grade. So we have a grade 2. The 100 is the base oil viscosity grade. Then in this case, for oil type, we're just going to use M to demonstrate that it's a mineral oil. And then AW is going to indicate the type of additive system. So in this case, we've used a light green for anti-wear. We've used a square that's going to tell us the NLGI grade. That's group 2. And then we've simply stated the base oil viscosity grade and the oil type in the text. So we have a PU-2-100-M-AW, which is going to be our specification for our electric motor grease. Now we could take this specification and give that to any lubricant supplier and have them recommend their product that fits that specification. It doesn't have to just be Chevron SRI grease. And that's the beauty of this system is once we've spelled out every part of the specification, we could give that to any potential lubricant supplier and they can provide a product that fits that specification. So now let's look at an example of creating a lube tag using the desk case isolink lubricant identification system. So in this case we're going to use a we're going to use patterns, shapes, and colors to identify the base oil type, the viscosity grade, and the type of additive system. So for the first part of our specification, let's look at the base at the base oil type. So in this case we have a PAO or group 4 or synthetic hydrocarbon. And in this case we're going to use the diagonal lines to represent that it's a group 4 base oil. The next part of our spec is the viscosity grade. Now for viscosity grade, we could use either a shape or a color. So in this case, let's just say we're going to use the circle to indicate that it's an ISO 220. Then the last part, this leaves colors for our additive system. So in this case we have an EP oil and we'll use say yellow to indicate that we have an extreme pressure oil. So using this system we have a PAO with the diagonal lines, we have an ISO 220, that's going to be the circle, and then we have an extreme pressure gear oil which is going to be yellow. Now, we did two things here. We created a very specific tag for that product, but if the lubricant manufacturer ever decides to change the name of that product, or if we switch to a different lubricant supplier, then we can use the same tag. We don't actually have to go out to all the machines and change all of the individual tags because our specification is going to stay the same and our lube tags are going to stay the same. So these generic types of tags or stickers are going to have a lot of advantage over brand specific tags or those that have the actual name of each individual lubricant. Once we've created a code for each type of lubricant that we use in the plant, we can create stickers or hang tags or any type of labeling system to actually apply an identification decal to each of our lubricated components all of our transfer tools to our our dispensing points in the lubricant storage area so that it makes it very easy for anyone who's transferring lubricants or applying lubricants to the machine to make sure that they're getting the correct oil in each application as I mentioned before it's very common in most plants to have mixtures of different lubricants and different machines which can significantly impair lubrication performance. So this is a critical part of precision lubrication and I would encourage everybody to develop a system like this and to tag each and every lube point in your plant so you can be sure that you're getting the correct lubricant in there. And don't forget about the other benefits as well of generic specifications such as consolidation and also eliminating the need for changing lubricant tags when you change from one product to another. This has been how to effectively implement a lubricant specification and tagging system. I'm Jared Pottinger, Education Services Manager for Deskcase.